podcast world. This is Caribbean Power Lunch, where we feature black owned businesses. I am your host, Kevin Valley, and today we are talking to agricultural journalist and enthusiast, Mr. Karan Bascom. Hello, good night. <laughs> I didn't know you was going to start. I was so energetic. I wanted <laughs> to talk to, like something to say. You know, to get everybody in the vibes, but you know, sorry, I have a, a droney voice. So it's another cup in there, you know, like a radio announcer, so like, well, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I kind of come in on the same tone, you know, good evening <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> All right. So Karen, you're award winning, world traveled agricultural journalist, been all over the place. You have this business, Tech for Agri, showcasing young agripreneurs yes right but i want to go back a little bit and everybody who listens to this podcast they know i like to start from the beginning mm. right so i want to know how we got into this was it where did you grow up in a in a rural area with a lot of farming and stuff were your parents farmers or so like how did you get into this all right well i was not involved in food or agriculture at all i was very disconnected from where my food comes from but when I went to, to UE, that was the year that, you know, the USA decided to invade Iraq and trade and had free money from oil. And one of the few good things that I think the government did was try to invest in our education. That was in 2004? Yeah. Okay. All right. But I would definitely say I do not think that the university was ready for the sheer numbers young people that would be seeking education to better themselves. And my program that I ended up just getting put into that program. Oh, you were put into, yeah. oh, cause I was, cause I was telling myself, Hey, you studied agriculture. So, I mean, it seems like it was more <laughs> intentional than anything. No, it, I was put into agribusiness and was told like it switch. So I pursued after the first year, I realized how important food is. It's the world's oldest economy and it, it is what is driving our world today. Right. And um, I decided to stick with it. After finishing, I jumped into my master's because everybody had a degree then after that time. And it was a whole lot more theory and it really was not matching with what was going on in the field. So I would start working with some lecturers to go and learn what's happening in the field. And the farmers just were not learning what we learned in class. So I felt like this was just... Can you give me an example of, of the disparity in, in the knowledge that was being I know, gained and transferred? Okay. If I went to a farmer and I said, I would like to collect data on your watermelons to test for heteroscedasticity. I remember that word from you. I remember right. that word. That was like my favorite word. That farmer is going to cuss me out and tell me get off his land because I am coming to you with something he does not know about. And I understand the point of economics and econometrics and all these other things, but we do not trade as one here in the Caribbean, so we simply do not have the volume. And the sign right now, our production methods do not allow us to have that massive volume. It's not impossible to have it if we use vertical farming, but we have, we know we have challenges to the sector here and information is stifled. So me, Doing the degree and jumping into my master's was, was as a result of that. Only being able to access certain information. We found out that when I say we, myself and other persons doing it, that degree, found out that it was not well marketed and people did not know what it was about. Everywhere you go is like, where is, where is that? Where is agribusiness? All right. And then there was one year someone from the ministry came to advertise positions for the Ministry of Agriculture, and she had no idea about the degree. So what, was that a new degree? Was that a new program? It was a relatively new degree, but the degree does not give you, let's say, for example, in the ministry, you need to have six points of learning. So crop production and, I don't know, some, you know, livestock, et cetera, et cetera. And our degree only gives us two. So a lot of you, UE students think that when they leave UV, they could just get a job in, for the government, you know, get a t- job teaching. After that, we can get any of that, you know, and that's just how UV students are left to think they have kind of, you know, they, they do not get that exposure to think of something different. And it's like, we realized, quickly realized that 
kind of get scammed here. This is making no sense. So on top of that, the environment of the UE pushes a lot of competition. To me, it's a detriment, you know, and a lot of, a lot of persons in charge in particular do not take into consideration that human element. I do not understand why we all here learn about or authoritarian, or what's the word? Authoritarian. Authoritarian. But when you go to workplaces in this country, that's all you meet. And it's like, that just cannot work for human beings. And that, that part of where, you know, y'all didn't inform me, it was just being ignored. And I said, decided I'm going to do my own thing, right? I'm going to, I wanted to find out about social media. And I always thought if it is, I wanted to make this degree and this agriculture thing more interesting to myself and other young persons, is to look at technology and innovation, all right? I still want to know what, what really struck that nerve though. Because, all right, on a rudimentary level, it's not like, Trinidad and the Caribbean on uh in terms of like, let's say the at least the middle class, the lower middle class even. There's not it's not like a lack of food per se. So you mentioned the importance of food, but it, like what what was the like the awakening factor in terms of hey, this food supply could only last the next 10, 20, 50 years or so. Like what what happened? Well, it somewhere along the line the message came through from various different sources that you need to eat every day. It doesn't matter what form it is or what it is. People need to eat every day and so then they eat it. But then you have all these other things that come to mind straight away, like food safety. You know, we have a lot of food fraud. There's plastic lettuce and plastic Food rice. fraud, is it? Yeah. That's the first time I've heard of some food fraud. Yeah, that's what term they will probably hear it more in America. Food fraud. Because it looks like food, but it's not. It's fake. It's like the processed meat and when they... Yeah, it's not real food <laughs> you know it's fake food food it's like it's like a business now wow it's an international business to for these people to prepare fake food and then export it <laughs> you understand but on there on there these um regulatory sanctions and there are but as unfortunately in our country nothing is properly enforced until it affects someone up there you understand? So when you say up there, you mean the upper class? Yes, <laughs> or the government. You understand? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, there is, for example, there is a food and drug administration here, right? But they don't have a lab. <laughs> so then, what is the point? I mean, what is all that purpose? <laughs> you understand? So how do they tell when when something is is not cool? So if like if they get the um what the cool runnings or like they they have their officers and they know their regulations, they can inform persons and that's about it. Because there is no lab, there's no lab to do it. There's no lab to do soil testing, you know. And that's a basic something for farmers. So in the agriculture sector here, as much as you may see news articles and stories, I have a trained eye. I am seeing your cutout photo with no real information. As in, you are saying your officers are here, but none of your officers in the picture. No other human being is in the picture. But you're describing that you work with so-and-so and so-and-so to help so-and-so country, our country. And that is simply not true. You understand? <laughs> so right. it's, 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 it's a lot goes on in the, in the sector. A lot of subsectors are totally and completely failing like the be like the honey industry failed for one and there's just no one to help except tech for agri because we are going to share the information to help yourself all right okay so we kind of we kind of going in a in an opposite direction right now right. okay so you finished your agri business degree mm -hmm. in 2009 and two years later you start up tech for agri but what happens during that two years what happened between that two years so that two years was the year I jumped into my master's. And um, after a year, I was not satisfied. There was one lecturer there who encouraged the students to do an exchange program. And I was like, this is one of my favorite lectures from undergrad anyway. And, and I'm going to listen to him. Like, I trust him. You know, he's given me good advice before. He gave me a job before. I'm going with this lecturer who I, and then other people validated this lecture as a good one. Okay. So I made the sacrifice and I raised the funds and I did a little short term work and I went across there. Oh, you raised the funds? Yeah, because funds is never any funds, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> and um, 
I ended up getting a little help from my parents one of the few times. And then, oh, <laughs> and then so I ended up going twice. So I might be mixing up when, who get funds where, but definitely like I had to raise funds. I got a little bit of funds from my department, right? So like about 3000 and then a little bit from my parents as well. And then I, I did the rest. When I was there, I did courses in print and electronic design and introduction to social media because 2006 is when Facebook came out and I was really into it. And I, I come off a high five like everybody else. <laughs> and I felt like this could really help with marketing, you know, in terms of marketing food. I felt like social media really gives you that connection between you and the person you want to sell something to. And you have to build that trust, you have to build that relationship. And I felt it could be useful. Unfortunately, I was the only person to have this thought and I was getting a lot of fight now. Unfortunately or fortunately? Yeah, yeah. No, you can say fortunately. But back then it was unfortunate because anything new, you know, becomes stifled, especially when other people are unaware of it because then they can't control it. So I didn't pay that mind because while I was on the exchange program, I got word that I had won this blogging competition on behalf of the Agribusiness Society of UE. Okay, so you had a blog win on all this time. It started, let's say, the first that year in my master's, 20, like 2011. Okay. So 2009 to 2011 was getting accustomed to master's, then I did the exchange program, and at the end of it, I ended up winning that competition. So the blog took me to the competition, which was in South Africa. And I'd never been that far before, and it was amazing experience. I met other young people like me from other countries, like the Mauritius and Kenya and Nigeria. And it was just, I found my calling. This is what I wanted to do. I didn't know me being good at writing would have brought that kind of passion out. And I realized I could build a career and started continuing volunteering. And soon after that, started building the mobile journalism skills. So you realized it was your calling at that point in time when you were all the way across in South Africa. So it really takes that yeah. that travel to see, you know, see the world, see how other people live, see how other that, people think, get that different frame of mind to really understand, hey, what is your purpose? All right, that's really interesting. And that was the first trip of many. Yeah. <laughs> at this point, I don't like to boast about it, but I have sort of lost count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's... it's it's a lot of countries to do different things, training, social media training, um, communications training. So you'll be invited by all of these, by what? By yeah. the prime minister, the minister of agriculture. It, Who would invite you? That's the thing. When I went to South Africa, I realized that the agriculture world is extremely huge. It is not just Trinidad. It's not just the ministry, the number of the endless statutory boards that we have here. It's the entire Caribbean region and all of their organizations, plus the world and all of their organizations. And there are new organizations coming up. There are old ones still going. You know, there are project-based ones, collaborations. To me, the opportunities are endless for a career in agriculture. If you consider the whole world, and it's called the agri-sphere sometimes. And it's like, it's huge. There's so much out there. Different careers, different jobs. I could, like, for me, I, I actually, I work from home. I work remotely. That continuing to build my skills in writing and reporting and this type of thing. I was actually building that. Like, all of that was self-taught. I didn't learn that at UE. You understand? So it's like, I'm seeing, I started to share opportunities a lot. I'm telling other people, hey, you know, I'm going somewhere like, Try this and try that, but very few people would follow in that footsteps. Okay. So we've been talking for a while now. We're talking about all these places you've been, you talk about what you've done, but we didn't, we didn't actually spell out what Tech for Agri is about. So Tech for Agri is a social enterprise that uses media, journalism, and communications to support agri youth, agripreneurs, and other agro allied sectors. Okay. So when you use the term, social enterprise people start to think oh how sweet you know you're trying to make a change you're trying to make a difference but the last thing they think uh, is that you you care about making money i do it's just second i care about people first and making money second the thing is 
that you are solving a need. If you make your business about solving a real need, not providing dog treats, a real need. So actual food. Give the dog actual food, you know, like actual meat, actual locally, locally made dog product, like food, nutritious product that you could feed your dog instead of buying something that's imported because that is costing us and it's costing the society have to pay for things like that. We have the capabilities here to really build as a good industry. Okay. All right. So that's why I tend to focus on media and information because the sector, there is a mentality in the sector to get up and do it yourself. Like there's an endless stream of WhatsApp groups and Facebook pages and people, I have this to sell, I'm doing this, I need help with this, I can provide this good, this service, this input. And all of that is just non-existent on our local ministries, websites or channels or anything like that. But I know it's there. And so those are the people that I'm going to feature. Right? Those are the people who are living their livelihoods just like me off of this. Right? So it's something that I, I have become even more passionate about because I am the same person I am trying to solve. I am facing the same problems that the sector is so reaching. Like, and if I don't do it, who's going to do it? To this day, there's nothing to support young people in agriculture on a stable basis. At this point in time, it's myself and Alpha, you know, Alpha tackling, Alpha creating Agriman. This is Alpha Senon. Alpha Senon, right. He created a superhero who is an agriculture superhero. So just think Captain Planet, but for agriculture. His name is Agriman. And that is get to kids, you know, children. I am really kind of guaranteed the ones now, people our age, the millennials of now, the ones who coming up, the little multiculturals who's like 15 16 they are the ones who in my opinion millennials could talk to multicultures we could communicate has that ever happened before for any generation ever like this to me is our chance to pass on the knowledge to avoid pitfalls to help each other rather than go through the experience that i had to go through in terms of realizing that locally there are so many challenges that they stifle agri youth and agri pioneers, you know so it's all about empowerment for me i am empowering myself by doing what i do to me the money will come certainly because when i look back to 2011 no way in hell did i think i would have flown to over 30 countries and actually be able to say hey i have a place to, to stay i rent i live you know i might be rich but i am content with what i have i'm sorry a lot of Trinidadians can't do that but i can and that comes from the traveling. That comes from crossing social statuses, like like social classes. Like I remember it's from Africa to flipping Europe to all these other places, to Uruguay to here, there, the other. I meet so many different people that at the end of the day, I am happy to have a place to sleep. You understand? It doesn't have to be a place with space. You understand? <laughs> I just need... A place to sleep that's safe, and I'm happy for that. You understand? And with that, that is the key to for me entrepreneurship. You're passionate about what you're doing, and you're happy. So if I know I'm happy now, what going to happen when I collect my, how much of my money from solving whatever world issue down the line? You don't think I'll be more happy? Elated? <laughs> I'll be elated. Yes, I'll be happy, but I was done happy already. So it's like you know, this come like an extra something, and come like being able to. You know, change social classes would be a reward down in the end, you okay. know? Or rather, I, I wish you could get, get rid of social classes entirely. I'm with you. I'm with you. I mean, that's, a, that's a whole other podcast, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Tech Fagri, you guys feature a lot of young entrepreneurs and stuff on the show a little two minutes, three minutes, on, you know, very, very current, very modern because, you know, people attention span short, yeah. attention span short, and they don't want to spend too much time consuming content. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so how many people have you featured so far and what have you learned from doing all of this? Well, I, and this is something I knew before, the level of innovation that comes from people who are on the ground and have a true problem to solve is amazing. I just like to put that on camera and show people what other people are doing to inspire them. I learned, I would definitely say I learned how to live your life, to live with some humility. You understand? Because have you ever tried running a food business of any kind for simple terms? You know, like 
a day-to-day food business, Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday. That is not an easy task. And the, a lot of people are by themselves or they have whatever few family members to help them out. So for me, if you are doing something that is that important, you are providing that food for people and you are able to take that in stride and be humble about it. To me, that is a good way to live your life. And I now try to emulate that, try to calm down, not be so vexed all the time (laughs) And, (laughs) and just deal with people on a reel because the majority, this is what I've learned for sure, for sure. The majority of people out there are good people. Yeah. They just want to live. They just want to be happy. They have their goals. They might see their challenges. They might need a little help. But the majority of people are good people. But but you do come across these so-and-so idiots who just want to pass on the nonsense and do poor business and just make it bad for everyone. You understand? So it's something I, I appreciate. I like to see people who have overcome their challenges without stepping on somebody else's tools. Okay. So I know your company focuses on food security, food sustainability, and um, technology, innovation, and climate change, right? So let's talk about climate change in a, in a, for a little bit, right? Right. So we all know that there's global warming. Like right now, we're in, this, we're in the cabin studios, the AC is on, but I'm still feeling a little hot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. So we all know that, that some climate change is happening, but... We want your educated opinion, like how severe it is and what really needs to be doing. I see you, you see that look on your face, like, well, you don't even know. People don't know how drastic this thing is. Like I was, we were talking earlier before the podcast and I was seeing we, that tech for Agri, we trying to emulate the journalism of today, which you mentioned short and to the point, but it's very visual. It's very storytelling based and it's factual. It's like based in science. Evidence is there. I mean, Trinidad and Tobago, may be horrible in terms of record keeping and data. But that is not the case in other parts of the Caribbean by a long shot. And certainly not in the other parts of the world. The data is there and it shows we're going to go through hell. And I'll try that not gonna go and be a trinity forever. Like we will get something. We don't have the flooding last year. Right? But this year, what could happen this year, right now we're in a drought situation. And I know sit have citizens out there who already take things in matters into their own hand to ensure they have water but really and truly what's going to happen if a true drought happen or if one of these bushfires decide to go down into a residential community on the northern range or in some other part of the country and the effects are there so how do you protect against that so that is the thing honestly <laughs> the danger now if you're keeping up with the international news is that we may be almost or too late before there's nothing we could do to reveal it then. So it's kind of like the climate change is building up to a point where it will be too hot and there'll be the, the amount and the frequency of these things will be come like every day. That's where it's heading to. And so the scientists and don't quote me, I'm going to look it up, you know, check out your Wired magazine and all these others that, we could reverse it. You know, we could cool the planet instead of making it warmer. But with the fight you're getting out there, especially at the high level, government level, the private company, private sector level, it's just not looking possible. So right now, there are, especially here in the Caribbean, there are a lot of climate resilience programs dealing with like genetics and stocking up germplasm and stocking up inputs. And then there's a lot of climate adaptation as well and mitigation. So after the event happened, this is the plan. This is what the village is going to do. A lot of disaster preparedness. It's a very much hot issue in other islands because they experience it. Trinidadians now, we have no clue. We have no clue what it's like to lose everything and have nowhere, don't know how to start over because your government ain't releasing the aid. You have nothing after one night of terror because you're sitting in your house and everything feels like it exploded. And then now you have nothing. We actually have a Tech for Agri a project called Agri Recovery Kit, mm-hmm. right? Where we liaise with our team. We have our, our team members, um, Mitchell in Dominic and Iba in Dominica. They are both farmers and they have a very 
good background in terms of media and community engagement. And together with entrepreneurs here in Trinidad, Brent Eversley and Shakila Daniels and myself, we are trying to create this kit that is going to be to help people shorten their recovery period. Because what we've learned from liaising with Iban and other persons in other islands, it takes almost a year or more to return to normalcy. So return to normalcy is the road is there, electricity is there, Wi-Fi is there, internet is there, et cetera, et cetera. You know, things are flowing at a normal pace. We are all developing countries. If it takes a year to return to normalcy, that is going to put off our eventual development. Certainly, we didn't expect the Caribbean region to be developing forever. And we have to get developed at some point. So it's like, these climatic changes, if it is we are saying it's going to be worse, when are we going to be developed if everything is going to get destroyed more often? Depending on what can happen, next thing we stop having hurricanes and we have cyclones. What's the big difference? Both of them could damage everything, so we need to prepare. And it's like our kit is a kit for people, it's for human needs, it's meant to provide that food resource, help you to grow your food right after the disaster until you can catch back yourself. I want to know what's in this kit. I want to see this. You want to see a video? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can send a video with we'll in the show notes. Yeah. But, um, so tell me what's, what's in this kit. Let me so the kit, know what's in the this kit list. would have farm input. So we have seeds and seedlings. We're looking at organic materials, organic pesticides, organic fertilizers, etc. A big part of the kit is the work myself and Mitchell does, which is media. So we are going to be like, okay, this is the kit. This is how you use the kit. And in that, not a part, not in the kit, rather, I should say, you have other tools. So, for example, we have sheet cloth inside there, where if you set it up a certain way, you can actually harvest water from the air. What kind of cloth is that, sir? Sheet cloth. So that's the material that goes on greenhouses here in the Caribbean because it's so hot. Okay. Can I use plastic? Some people use plastic, but that's their choice. You know, shake lot is an option and it's helped, it's used for protected greenhouse, protected agriculture. So you use your, you have your, your field production or whatever, wherever you're growing your crops. Usually a good farmer would have his own nursery to ensure supply of his food inputs. So the shake lot will be used in a small structure for the nursery or for overall protection of the crops from wind and the sun and all of that. And it's something that we think we could utilize. So we could say, okay, here's your shade cloth. You can use it to create an industry. You can use it to create a shaded area for you and your family, but you could also use it to get water for your crops. Okay. Right? So there's a, we intend to include other videos that would look at these things. So after disaster practices. That's in the recovery kit. It wouldn't be in the kit, it would oh. be online. Yeah, I wonder what else in the kit. So, in the kit, we definitely would have your organic input. So, fertilizer, organic fertilizer, organic pesticide, fungicide, your seeds and your seedlings, your grow bags, your sheet cloth. I think that would be the major, major items. And the, the knowledge videos as well, which is a big part of it, that we want to keep online. So, for example, we want to say how to use a, do a video about how to create a Bluetooth mesh network so that you could communicate with your loved ones or communicate with your village council or whatnot. And then we want to be able to, let's say, put that or have people be able to save that. So, in the kit, one other key thing would have been a mobile charger. So, people could charge their phones once they have them on them. Keep your phone, charge your phone, and then use your phone to communicate. And communicate with your loved ones, make sure they're okay. But then use that to work together to help everyone. So, we learned that village councils, when they had the event, they would uh, work together. Then they had... The schools would act as the main place to store food and then they would distribute it and work together. So we are saying we could work together in terms of our kit being complementary to that process and other participatory processes. Okay. Earlier you were talking about the differences in terms of agricultural development in different places in the world that you've been and the Caribbean and Trinidad in particular. I want to kind of cement that gap. 
I want to make it crystal clear so we could make that message even clearer for the audience. So what is it like in so many countries you've been in compared to what is what it's like in Caribbean and Trinidad? Um, farms farms in other parts of the world, in particular developed countries, you are dealing with like families that have been doing agriculture for years and so they are good at it. It's kind of like in their blood. And doing that for years comes generational wealth and they're able to make that investment. And because they are the ones who is supplying the food, the support services, they would actually prepare technologies for them. So biogas, one of the major things that I first saw was a huge biogas uh, facility that actually saved a dairy farm. Like we went there, the farmer had a big red, not a big red, a big red brick house, yes, and also a red Porsche in front of his house. And this was the old man in the house family. Like this is the father and he had his three sons and they were all doing, taking care of the land. And they lived in, in two separate houses on the farm and it was like a main house and the attached house. Very successful. And they were actually going to go out of business because in Germany, it is so efficient and so industry functions so well that milk became cheaper than water. So if one liter of water was one euro, milk was like 69, 89 cents because there are so many dairy producers who are all the access, they all have access to the technology. They all know what they're doing and they're all producing quality milk it has to get cheaper because there's so much milk out there and exporting it is an issue, right? So to me, I just do see that happening in Trinidad, you know? Like, I know that there are people doing technologies of that level to say in smaller ways. So like Garden Pool is one and there's there's these people doing a cube farm, which is all the vertical farming. But... For everybody to be at that level, it just, you have to have a functioning government, a functioning industry. And we just don't have that. We lack regulatory bodies. We lack actual support. Like they, like actual support just does not exist. You know, so these things, that's the big difference. And you can only know this if you see it. You have to go and see it. Seeing it online is great. Seeing it on TV is great. But seeing it in person, being able to ask your own questions and come into the realization for yourself is a different story. Okay. So zeroing in on Trinidad, like you already did, we know that the agricultural industry brings less than 1% of Trinidad's gross domestic product, right? GDP. Mm-hmm. All right. So I know you said the government needs to put things in place, but what about the private sector? Do you think... That how do we get the private sector to invest more in this? How do you get them a week? Well, I would say the private sector is already invested and in, in, in it. It's just that uh, the private sector and they're in it to make money. So they would keep their operations and what they are doing quiet. But what about your your, your guys up there in Germany make with the red Porsche? I mean, they they sound like they <laughs> like they they're making their money too. So why I mean why are you hitting on the private sector trying to make some money? Okay, so it's like, for me, the, like how I say, okay, I'm making money a second. Mm-hmm. That means I put the human need first. That means I make sure that my final product is of the right quality and is safe. And, you know, I'm helping somebody nutritious wise. Of course. That is not the case with a lot of, of the private sector. They just, they only care about that, that dollar. Is there a way to, Achieve both needs here, both, both objectives. I here. think they are. I think it is, but that's just, they're just not doing that. I mean, to make it, to make it, <laughs> <laughs> to make, sorry, to make this agriculture in, industry more efficient other than the government in, invested in it. And that's something we are working on. We are seeing, we are trying to establish the best way I see it is through those communication channels. And they can't be fake. They have to be genuine. So in order for the information to be taken seriously, for the person to want to change, to want to make a difference. The information is key to empower persons. A lot of persons in the sector, even in the private sector, are self-motivated. They are self-sufficient. They get things done for themselves. And so they would then 
work towards investing in whatever. But being that they are at that level, they would just say, hey, government, I am at this level, invest in me. And that makes sense from a government standpoint because they are the bigger ones. But there are too many small farmers and agribusinesses and small processors and little entrepreneurs out here that are totally being forgotten. And I am saying you can help them through information. You can empower them yourself. What I am saying is not new. Everybody is saying it. Everybody is dissatisfied. And yet still there is this endless competition, this endless fight in the sector. It's stupid. That's what I think it is. Okay. There needs to be collaboration and competition. That is one of the, that is one of our greatest mottos because we can help each other rather than fighting amongst each other. There is enough resources to do what we need to do, but it's as though when you get to that certain level in the private sector, you get to that government level. It's as if you cannot see beyond that. You cannot see what somebody who is in a difficult situation dealing with the problems of the sector, you cannot see their solution because their solution is not, it's all will be out of the box. It will be so far removed from what they are accomplished understanding. And then there's also this attitude that because you did a few things or because you work with a few persons, you did your job, you only do your job when there's real impact and when people can safely say, yes, our minister is doing a good job. So like, I have a, I don't like the ministry at all, but everybody know who the most impactful minister of agriculture was because everybody knew we talked about it, mm -hmm. right? Instead of just letting things remain as they are. It's a stupid Trinidadian habit to just leave things as they are. I'm not doing that. No, I mean, I, I agree. You don't leave things as they are. If you have a problem with something, you take action and try to get it changed. So let me ask you a question. If you were to get, now you as an informed person in the agricultural sector, right? Mm. If you were to get a check for, let's say, 10 million U.S., how would you use that to take the agricultural sector from where it is now to another level? And let me know if you need more money than that. Well, it depends. That would be a good start. I would definitely expand the interaction and what you are doing specifically to help the stakeholders. So the stakeholders would say they have XYZ problem and you now have to solve it. But that is a collaborative thing. All right. So which stakeholder is you speaking about in particular? The stakeholder could be the farmers, the stakeholder could be people who I always, invested in the money. I always think in small, so small entrepreneurs, okay. farmers, processors, small food innovators, people who run their business in all these markets that have popped up. So this is what I'm saying. We know the sector is functioning within the last five years is, is so oral market is south market is green market is this market is all over the place and these things have come up by themselves individuals in China that started them not the government they are the stakeholders people are going and spending their money there and they're willing to because if you put all that especially those handicraft and food innovation people that's a lot of experimentation that's a lot of resources that's time people are willing to spend their money there and i am saying we need to build more of that so that's where you'd spend the 10 million. Yeah. I in would, research and development, essentially. Yeah. I wouldn't even say yes, research, but I would say taking those, those small entrepreneurs and businesses and putting them on the map to put Trinidad on the map and having them work together and, and like actually start creating. Like, let's say, for example, I was thinking about the fashion industry the other day and I'm saying to myself, well, what comes out of agriculture ways that could be used for fashion? And I am saying to myself, how much designers we can have. But if we encourage a mentality of, I mean, people in China like to dress nice, they like to do this, they like to do that. What's so wrong in getting something made? People just do it all the time. Why not push that and say, well, okay, we have this empty friggin' building in town, fix it up, and we lay it out, make it look like Project Runway, and have these some create it as a job for our seamstresses and like have them being the ones Making closer people in China so that people in China are like, ah, oh, cause are realizing now you need to celebrate certain moments in life, your birthday, your graduation, this that, and make something. It doesn't have to be expensive. We could do the research that is needed to see what would be a reasonable price for the, your efforts versus what customers are paying. 
and you do that in the long run. You encourage the fashion aspect, the creative aspect. If it's agricultural waste, how long it gonna last? So you encourage that aspect of people pushing there, using what we have here and making use of it and being proud about it. And I am saying that come like the new, the new career for nurses. You know, everybody at one point, I was like, people like, we don't mean a nurse because, you know, they need nurses. This could have been a whole new career. And that's just one part. What is going to happen when we talk about the technology involved? We computer aided design. You understand? We need people to manage those machines. We need people to make those machines first. So that is one industry, three different subsectors. And it's like, you still coming with the same agricultural incentive every year <laughs> come on they just can't think outside of the box as we do you understand and, and they also can't communicate with us the people on the ground you can't because you put yourself up there and now you're afraid of everybody longer because you're afraid of everybody after what you have or whatever you can't communicate with the people who are suffering you don't have a problem we do you understand so i just think when I stay in my humanity so I could always be able to solve these problems and build a long-term thing, like a legacy thing, rather than uh, how much money I could pass on to my child. My child can make money for himself. He'll be very intelligent. I mean, I know I'll pass on a lot, but I will teach him what to do. The idea is passing on the knowledge and nothing staying forever, so making that change. Things had to change, and they don't know how to do change. All we know is stability. We don't have that anymore. We have no oil, people. <laughs> we have no oil. <laughs> I love how you talk about legacy. Yeah. I want to pass on a legacy. A legacy doesn't have to involve all this money. I don't know how much money the Jackson family seen from Michael Jackson stuff. Really <laughs> and truly. I mean, really. I know they're seeing it, but really, and again, all the money that Michael Jackson reeking in in his debt. <laughs> I, I do not know. I do not know. I rather a legacy for long term development. I think about the future and us as a species, human beings evolving and stop treating each other like, you know, the S word. I remember I couldn't curse. <laughs> no, I said you can use you can use the F word or the C word. Uh, but when you say in freaking and all these things, I said, uh, you do what you want. I got <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I know it now I curse my father. I wonder if I cuss or not yet. <laughs> so I say S word. Alright, so tell me, for the listeners out there, how would you advise them to join this agriculture movement? What can we do at home? What little part can we do as non agricultural experts? What can we do? As non-agricultural experts, I would definitely say get yourself informed. If it's one thing the ministry does, let me be positive. If it's one <laughs> thing they do, is this training that they have. No, the stupid thing is if the class is not full, they're not going and have the training and whatever other dumb reasons, then it's not being offered frequent enough, but at least it's there. So local residents can try that. Internet and regional and international definitely go online. There's endless videos now for you to learn and start doing for yourself. Consider how can you lower your food bill? Actually sit down and write it out for one month if you could and say, well, how much money you're spending in doubles and restaurant and food in the house. And then consider what would happen if you really try to start doing your own garden to curb that cost because it is the biggest bill in your house. Apart from the house itself, maybe, maybe not, depending on the size of your house. And suppose you have a family and nine, you know, or six or, <laughs> you know, you really start from there. Inform yourself first and then think about you and your life and what, what you have to do with your nine to five or your wherever and see how you could start a little garden of your own just to cut your costs. A good way to start a season, everybody is by seasoning. Think about it. If you always have season in your yard, you always ready for a lime. Anybody can come by you anytime. <laughs> you know, that means you providing access. Think about it. <laughs> okay. Think about your food access. You know, like the other day, my card ripped, like the metallic strip ripped. Right. And I 
have any money. I couldn't buy food. I didn't. I wanted to go in the grocery. They couldn't go in the bank and stand up in the line again. Man. No, it was night time, so I had to go to bed hungry. There had nothing in the house. It had nothing. You know, I was like, shit. I didn't go in the grocery. <laughs> you know, I didn't make anything. I didn't cook anything. So, was, and I did penniless. So I literally had to wait the next morning. <laughs> You know, that's food access. Some places in the world, they can't, there's no grocery nearby. There's no way to get nutritious food. So it's like, see if you could, if you could provide that for yourself, right? Another good way is see a nutritionist. Like, don't go to the doctor, go to the nutritionist. The nutritionist will tell you, they will do the little tests, the little analysis, the little MRA and all of that. MRA? Yeah, like the... The little scan, there's like a scan on your feet and oh, okay, okay. there's a machine that they use and they, they use the me- me- metallic gel and they, they, I, I carry him with a few and he, she put the gel on his chest and his heartbeat. Like an ultrasound kind of something? Yeah. Okay. So the, the heartbeat, um, <laughs> the signal was able to read or a lot in his body. Okay. We found out he had high pesticide levels. So we're like, what pesticide? What from what? What are you talking about? I am certain it's from the food he's eating. And the fact that, you know, they eat food in a can, a lot of tin food. Oh, yeah. And then we need to consider the vegetables themselves because we buy food with our eyes. So there is that culture. And we can't deny there is that culture in Trinidad, especially your food must look a certain way. So that's too much pesticide, too much this, just to keep the food from looking at a certain way. But if it is you really do your information, see what you need and you try it and see what happens. People change when they bring something up for themselves like that. And then when they eat the food and they recognize the difference, you know, like something, you know, it's either you might start to get sick and then you're, whatever in your system come out or you just realize that this food we was eating wasn't really that good. You know, I have a problem with some of the chicken you just get here. Like, I don't understand why I have to have these deposits as I cannot identify what part of the chicken is this and the heel and the wing and, and the tie and stuff. It's like, what is that? Is whatever chemicals just coalescing and I don't want to eat chicken like that. <laughs> I really don't. Uh, you know, and, and I'm a big guy so and I like to eat so I just need to watch what I eat. And the, the only true way to watch what you eat is to grow it for yourself because you literally will watch it grow for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but what if you don't have our own yard or anything to, to That's not an excuse. That's not an excuse at all. You have vertical farming, you have this, that, the other so many small spaces could turn into a growing space. Give me a one minute primer on vertical farming. In my cabin studio, a cabin apartment, could go and just start my vertical farming. How do I start? Okay, so there's room here, so you could probably have your vertical farm as an ornament for your apartment. So just like all the AC standing up over there, the vertical farm is stuck at stand up over here. And it's vertical, so like it, it's going to maximize how much you're producing. That stack could be seven to ten stacks high, and each stack could have like three to five plants in it, depending on where you grow. You could schedule out and have your food for a week. And that is just really stack. It have the fridge, it have a window farm, you pay it outside, you have all these steps. Anywhere it could become a growing space once you organize it and design it as you see fit. Okay. Karen, where can we find you online? Where can we find you? All right. So just Google Tech for Agri with the number four, and you will find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Tech for Agri is T E C H, the number four, A G R I. It is not the same. There is a local event called Tech Agri Expo. That is not my event. Do not associate me with that, please. It's not my event, right? I may be there. I hope to be at the event. <laughs> You're gonna be there. To attend, but I, I am. I didn't plan anything with that. So I didn't. Tech for Agri is a registered name and business. Tech for Agri is a registered company of Trinidad and Tobago. And we also have a non-profit called Agri Youth. Okay. I registered it in 2014, and then Agri Youth I registered last year in January. Okay, great. Right, so we are registered at the event. Tech Agri Expo is something separate and it has nothing to do with me. Don't call my name. <laughs> right, understood, understood, understood. Right. 
<laughs> All right, Karen, I am going to take the chance. Mm. I'm going to give you open forum, open mic, open platform to say anything you want to say that you feel has been left out of this interview before we wrap. Well, the only thing would have been my attempts for Tech for Agri. Recently, we have been having so many problems. There's still that challenge of local support. I myself have had personal problems with my family and not having the support that I needed. But I've realized when I stand here and I look back to 2011, I, again, I really would not have expected to reach where it has gotten. And I have to just... Do what entrepreneurs just do. We just finish, you know, we just get it done. We just keep working. And I know that what we aiming for in terms of success is close. You know, we have other projects like the ARC. Um, we have another project called Hive Energy where we're trying to get energy from bees. You see how that goes. And we want to do Tech for Agri 360. We want to do all these other different things. We just need the resources. My experiences has taught me that it takes time. So however long it'll take, it will take, but I know it will come. So we just have to keep working, work smart, and, excuse me, move forward because I know what we are doing is of value. I myself am of value, so I move forward and whatever happens, happens. I actually think it's exciting because I know I'll be good. You know, I have my skills. I know what I'm about. So, the future could come then, you know, I'm not afraid of it. And that's something that Trinidadians, we need. As far as I can say, Nihola Trinidad need a phenomenological rupture, something drastic that is going to change your mind. So the day that Trinidad, that God decides he's not a Trini, that is going to change people's minds. It happened a little bit with the flooding, but for those who were not in, in, in it, as usual, they didn't care. But it will happen. And what we are doing, we know is going somewhere. The change will happen. So we'll just be happy, you know, smiling when it happens. You know, I'll be like, that's when I, when we could become successful, I'll do a whole comedy routine and the <laughs> nonsense I went through coming up to wherever that successful point is. Yeah, it'll make a nice story. Yeah. See, that's entertainment. For sure, I could get money. For sure, I could be like, money, profits. Yeah, because that's like, one and done. But if it is I want to make an impact on the world, it has to be a need-based something. Human-centered first. Podcast will. there you have it. Planting a seed with Karan Bascom. Subscribe to Caribbean Power Lunch at caribbeanpowerlunch.com slash subscribe. Check us out on CastBox, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And with that... Podcast World, Cabin Studios, we are out.